In that reaction to Dabru Emet, I also cited an example of the sort of Jewish demand upon Christians that Rabbi Soloveitchik opposed and that can so easily lead to reciprocal demands. A prominent Jewish ecumenicist, and again, a really prominent one, denounced a Catholic document for implying that at the end of days, Jews would discover that the Messiah is, after all, Jesus of Nazareth. Such a denunciation of such a, uh, denouncing such a Christian uh, uh, assertion or implication is, in my view, a virtual reductio ad absurdum of the sort of interference in the faith of the other that Rabbi Soloveitchik warned about. As Dr. Korn notes, and as I emphasized in my reaction to Dominus Jesus, Cardinal Ratzinger's expectation that Jews will recognize the truth of Christianity at the end of days is entirely unobjectionable and indeed parallels Rabbi Soloveitchik's assertion of the eschatological confirmation of Judaism. While this assertion does not necessarily mean that non-Jews will, in Dr. Korn's formulation, adopt the current practices of Judaism, it does mean that they will recognize its truth and adopt its creed. Cardinal Ratzinger's vision, however, is not confined to the eschaton, to the end of days. He appears interested in bringing individual Jews to a recognition of Christian truth even before the end of days, and he sees interfaith dialogue, though that is not its only purpose in his view, as one means of accomplishing this end. Uh, it is worth noting that even in the Middle Ages, the survival of a Jewish collective until the Second Coming was seen as part of the divine plan and so saying that the Jewish people should exist till the end of days is not in and of itself uh, proof that, uh, that a person is not interested in converting Jews. Uh, I argued for this understanding of the Cardinal's position in that article on Dominus Jesus and cannot revisit it now, though perhaps I will uh, later in the discussion. But at least as I see it, even Rabbi Soloveitchik's concern about a missionary aspect of dialogue has not been rendered altogether obsolete by the developments underscored by Dr. Korn, although uh, there is no question that the large majority of Christians, uh, of Catholics who engage in dialogue uh, uh, do not have conversion in mind. The assertion that the caveats expressed in confrontation bear continuing relevance does not mean that they carry the authority of Sinaitic revelation or that they are easy to apply. I have already emphasized my understanding that Rabbi Soloveitchik was not asserting the categorical impossibility of all theological communication. Persuasive anecdotal evidence indicates that he worried about the lack of qualifications for such dialogue among most Orthodox rabbis, a concern that comes to the fore in Dr. Korn's eloquent peroration. One of the rabbis most committed to enforcing Rabbi Soloveitchik's guidelines has told me on more than one occasion that his revered mentor had said that he trusted Rabbi Walter Wurzberger to deal with theological issues in conversation with Christians, because he was qualified. Discussions of anti-Semitism, which Orthodox representative, <coughs> representatives consider kosher and even essential, lead to consideration of the most sensitive issues involving sacred Christian texts, or certainly can lead to them. For pragmatic reasons, Orthodox Jews want Christians to understand the theological importance that Judaism assigns to the land of Israel. Because of these blurred boundaries, uh, I have prepared several presentations on such issues in a dialogical setting with the approval, sometimes enthusiastic, as in the case of Jerusalem or Israel, sometimes ambivalent, of Orthodox organizations. This is not an exact science. And Dr. Korn's own caveats toward the end of his talk may mean that our positions are not that far apart. However that may be, the value of interfaith discussion is real, and its dangers, especially to traditionalists, are no less real. The 40-year-old document that we are addressing today is very much alive. <coughs> I want to start by um, thanking Dr. Langer, Dr. Cunningham for inviting me to um, be on such a distinguished panel. Um, I should begin, I suppose, by trying to figure out my own place in such distinguished company. Um, I don't claim to be a, to um, have personal ex encounters with Rav Soloveitchik. 
Um, although I have delivered some scholarly papers, I don't claim comprehensive acquaintance with Rabbi Soloveitchik's work, and I am certainly not an expert on Catholicism. Um, what I do think that perhaps I bring to offer is uh, I am a member of the generation that I think will determine whether Rabbi Soloveitchik's words will survive his living memory and what they will mean um, after that time. And I think I stand as a reasonable representative of what an Orthodox Jew with some openness, um, with a real interest in um, participating in the first confrontation Rabbi Soloveitchik talks about, and with some professional interest in that regard as a member of the United Ministry at Harvard University, Whereas it happens, my best friend for many years was Father Tom Brennan, the undergraduate Catholic chaplain, um, to my regret now recalled to Rome. Um, so I think I can offer a reasonable test of, what it is, of how it is that Catholicism appears to um, my generation of modern Orthodox Jews. Um, I also want to join at the outset, because of these concerns, um, Dr. Korn's prayer that I not misrepresent either the positions of Rabbi Soloveitchik or of Catholicism and that everything that um, happened here contribute to the greater recognition of the image of God um, that is in each of us. Um, I sp let me begin um, sub substantively by stating that on um, the issue, apparently the reading issue between Dr. Korn and Dr. Berger as to whether confrontation opposes non-disputational interfaith dialogue, uh, I am wholly with Dr. Berger and I second his evaluation that Dr. Korn's inspirational reading does excessive violence to both the language of the article and to the historical record. In the limited time we have here, it seems pointless to cite specific textual and factual grounds for this conclusion. I also associate myself fully with Dr. Berger's estimation of the practical value and dangers of such dialogue, and I would in any case be strongly inclined to defer to his superior experience and judgment, and again, I don't see the point of adding my own anecdotes and analysis. I wish instead to take as my point of departure what Dr. Berger compellingly cites as a basic conceptual difficulty with Dr. Korn's reading. Dr. Berger says, as I understand him, that such a reading utterly disjoins the philosophic and practical arguments of the essay. The philosophic argument in confrontation is that the communication of religious experience across faith communities is impossible in principle. The practical argument is that the conditions for such communication are not in place as the philosophic argument is that no such conditions are possible or even perhaps imaginable, the arguments are incompatible. But it seems to me, Bibichilat Kvodo, that Dr. Berger's own reading is subject to a variant of the same critique. Dr. Berger explains that the Rav declared theological conversation, quote, out of bounds, unquote, because it presumed to enter a realm in which communication is impossible. He does not, so far as I can see, explain why the impossibility of ultimate success makes the attempt not worthwhile. After all, much of the Rao's philosophy is built on a tragic vision of humanity ever engaged in a Sisyphean effort to draw near to God the Holy Other, knowing all the time that the closer we draw, the more powerfully we are repelled, and that repulsion is, ulti repulsion is ultimately inevitable. In other words, even in Dr. Berger's reading, there is no necessary connection between the philosophy and the prescription in confrontation. And this, to me, is a problem not merely because it indicates that we have not yet fully understood what the Rav meant. We might say, after all, that his writing is very complex, and so long as we know what he wanted done, we have the leisure to figure out why he wanted it done. But to my mind, um, the Hebrew phrase is la aniyut dati, in the poverty of my opinion, too many discussions within modern orthodoxy devolve into sterile and futile debates about the precise meaning of specific phrases in the Rav's writings, in which none of the participants have any live appreciation of the rationales behind his writing. And those rationales matter, not least here. Dr. Korn claims that times have changed since confrontation was written. The question before us is not only whether that change permits a different response, but whether it demands a different response. Um, and here I want to thank uh, Dr. Cunningham for giving me an advanced copy of his presentation, which I think is a stellar example of the kind of Catholic change which demands a response. Um, to answer the question right, of whether it demands a different response, um, it's not sufficient that we follow Rabbi Soloveitchik's words. It is necessary for us to fully understand them and to evaluate the extent to which they still apply. So with that aim in mind, let us return to the first question Dr. Korn raised, whether confrontation is a psak, a legal decision, rather than a policy statement, 
His evidence that it is not a psak is that the language is English, and the terms used in motive argument are entirely non-legal. I admit this, although I question whether the response of Rav Moshe Feinstein cited as contrast is in fact much different. But I submit that the rhetoric of presentation does not determine the status of the material. Confrontation may not be a halachic responsum, but nonetheless either record or reflect a halachic decision. And it was, I think, certainly taken by his students and by the Rabbinical Council of America as a psak, as a halachic decision. The question then is why Rabbi Soloveitchik chose not to write it as a halachic responsum. One might answer simply that, for whatever reason, the Rav rarely, if ever, published Javot. And that simply was not his general mode of addressing the public. Um, I'd like to suggest, however, that in this case, Rav Soloveitchik had an excellent reason for avoiding halachic discourse. Confrontation, as um, Dr. Korn points out, is clearly aimed at least as much as a Catholic as at a Jewish audience. And any halachic discussion of Catholic-Jewish dialogue would perforce begin with a discussion of whether Catholicism is considered avodah zarah, or strange worship. Right? Dr. Berger notes that it's often misleadingly translated as idolatry, but I think strange worship is a, um, is a good term. Bringing up that question as to whether, right, whether Catholicism is avodah zarah um, would have been both impolite as a response to an invitation to dialogue, and in politic, as Catholicism had been a primary source of virulent anti-Semitism, and had played an at best ambiguous or ambivalent role in the Holocaust a mere two decades before a confrontation was written. But even if the Rav did issue a halachic ruling against interfaith dialogue, that psak, just like a policy statement, even if we take his, ha his halachic authority as absolute and his policy authority is not absolute, neither of which are obvious assumptions to me, uh, may have been a response to circumstances which have since changed. And clearly, I believe that circumstances have changed, as I am discussing before you a topic that I think the Rav thought prudent to avoid. Dr. Korn gives an impressive list of changes in official Catholic theology. I have much sympathy with his overall conclusion, but I'd like to frame the evidence differently. To my mind, over the past 40 years, the Catholic Church has engaged in a stunning and perhaps unprecedented act of mass tshuva, of genuine repentance unmotivated by any external fear. The church was not defeated, but nonetheless reassessed its ways and theology almost wholly in response to a recognition of its own past evil. I am less confident in the comprehensiveness and especially in the permanence of that repentance than Dr. Korn. What one pope has done, another can put asunder. I will never forget Hirsch Goodman in the, in the August 2001 issue of, Jerusalem, of the Jerusalem Report explaining that the peace of Oslo had become entrenched in Palestinian hearts to the extent that it was irreversible. The Vatican's grudging and belated diplomatic acceptance of the Israeli state is, to my mind, far from an acknowledgement of the Jewish right to our homeland. My strong sense is that an America-centric perspective dramatically overestimates the extent to which the new church theology about Jews has penetrated the actual church, both the hierarchy and the laity. Nonetheless, the church as an institution, and in particular this pope, of whom I am an admirer, um, and crossing the threshold of hope, in my opinion, is an excellent book. Um, despite, the, um, despite what I think is the occasional moral blindness of his Mideast policy, um, have engaged in a repentance of sufficient depth that I believe we as Jews are morally compelled to respond. The question is whether that response should take the form advocated by Dr. Korn of interfaith dialogue explicitly on theological issues, or whether it should instead take the form that Rabbi Soloveitchik advocates in confrontation, which, as Dr. Korn notes, the modern Orthodox community has unaccountably and to my mind inexcusably ignored to stand shoulder to shoulder with Catholics in the work of building a just society that upholds the dignity and worth of each of its members. To answer that question, to answer the question of what kind of response is demanded from us by this repentance, requires us to truly understand why the Rav drew the line where he did and to evaluate whether it should still be drawn there. And my argument is that such an understanding requires us to show how the prescriptions of confrontation flow directly from its philosophy. Let us return then to the basic philosophic question posed well by Dr. Korn. How could the Rav, a man steeped in Christian theology, who delivered the intensely personal confession lonely man of faith to a Catholic audience, claim that the attempt to communicate religious experience across faith communities is worthless and absurd? After all, he analogizes the impossibility of communicating across faith communities to the impossibility of communicating within a faith community. Should Orthodox Jews not talk about faith and theology to each other? He analogizes both 
to the impossibility of communicating between individuals, and particularly between men and women. Should we then forbid marriage? Worse, in Lonely Man of Faith, he argues that it is precisely the experience of God which enabled Adam and Eve to break out of their monadic existences and form a community. Why then cannot Jews and Catholics do likewise? I submit that here is precisely Rabbi Soloveitchik's point. The existential chasm between individuals can be bridged via God, but only by forming a community. And Rabbi Soloveitchik makes clear that his vision of community is one which creates a shared identity while preserving separate identities. His depiction of the marital community is rooted in the Hebrew phrase ezer kenegdo, helper and opposer. The marital community is desirable because men and women cannot lose their genders, because gender is irreducible, and therefore the formation of the shared identity of community cannot extinguish the separate identity of individuals. But Jews and Christians, and Judaism and Christianity, are not irreducible. And so the result of community on the theological level must, I believe Rabbi Soloveitchik argues, lead inevitably to the loss of individual identity. Jews and Christians should not marry at the theological level. To maintain the dynamic of Ezer Kinegdo, of helper and opposer, we join in the first confrontation Rabbi Soloveitchik speaks about, that of human beings versus the, non, the unmeaning world, but maintain our separate identities with regard to the second. Another way of putting it, what gives Jews their identity as a Jewish community and Christians their identity as a Christian community is their experience of God. Using that experience to build community will create shared experience, in other words, shared identity, with no lines to preserve particularity. Dr. Korn argues against this, um, and I do not deny his right to disagree, but I do think this is a disagreement with rather than an interpretation of the Rav, that contemporary dialogue need not involve the shared identity. I um, admit to real trouble comprehending this. Why is this dialogue so important if it does not change the participants? And it seems to me that Dr. Korn's own paper undermines this claim. He is not afraid that we will dictate to the community of the many, yet he writes, quote, I'm not sure if you read this, um, I believe that we remember is the beginning of the church confrontation with its role in the Holocaust. It is not its last word. Continued discussion, reflection, and soul searching are necessary. What is this, if not dictation to the community of the many, of what theological issues they must undertake, and even of what conclusions they must reach? Dr. Korn is not afraid that we will trade theological favors, yet the dialogue must take place under the condition that each side affirms the validity and incommensurable worth of the other, at least in non-eschatological times. What is this if not the trading of theological favors? Let me even grant this recognition with regard to Catholicism. Um, right, let, um, Halachic Judaism has not on its own reached this recognition with regard to Catholicism. They may have reached it with regard to us, but I don't think that it's mutual. And so therefore, if this is a precondition of dialogue, I believe that we as Orthodox Jews are far from prepared to engage in it. Perhaps we should. I am open to the claim that the ongoing Catholic repentance should cause us to reevaluate our attitudes, um, bearing in mind the caveat that we should not hint the, trait, right, the revision of, of um, attitudes, of long-held historical attitudes. But such reevaluation cannot be required if the dialogue is to be genuine. We have much internal dialoguing to do first. I should note, though, that there is a vast difference along the argument I am making between a dialogue of individuals and a dialogue of communities, and particularly a dialogue of institutions. The Rav responded to an official Catholic invitation to engage in official dialogue. Private dialogues, where the goal is human rather than religious community, may be entirely different, although they are subject to the caveats that both speakers mentioned. Um, I note in this regard that Lonely Man of Faith refers to an experience of the divine that the Rav claimed was generically human rather than particularistically Jewish, and so did not implicate his identity. Finally, there may well be times, as Dr. Berger notes, when some greater good justifies some degree of risk. For example, the process of Catholic tshuva may require an understanding of Judaism to get past or appreciate the importance of particular issues, and that understanding should not be deliberately withheld. At the same time, I note again that halachic Judaism has not gone quite so far as official Catholicism in our recognition of the other's values, and accordingly, it behooves us not to dictate how they regard us theologically, so long as their theological positions do not infringe on our human and religious rights. A mutual non-proselytizing pact is highly desirable, but Orthodox rabbis are not likely to stop seeing conversion from Judaism to Catholicism as apostasy, even if, as I know and greatly appreciate, 
some priests express their understanding for the reverse case. Perhaps this asymmetry should give us pause, but that should be the topic of an, of an internal rather than an external um, dialogue. Nonetheless, um, I want to close by repeating my endorsement and encouragement and strong support for the call for uh, um, Dr. Korn's call for us to fulfill Rabbi Soloveitchik's imperative that we engage in the human confrontation side by side with men of goodwill among all religions and the ongoing Catholic tshuva is one reason among many we should look to Catholics in particular in our efforts to fulfill this. Uh, I had the privilege on Friday of um, hearing uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the Chief Rabbi of the United Kingdom, uh, was the author of the highly regarded work Dignity of Difference on this very topic, um, in which he came, he, he came up with a formulation that I find very powerful. He said, um, as a description of his own tremendously powerful interfaith work in the area of um, social concerns of the, of the building of values, both within and across communities, that rather than engaging in dialogue, let us become friends. Let us, become, let us become good friends, better friends, even best friends, and may our joint efforts produce a better world. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm tempted, since two of my predecessors opened with a prayer, to somehow recraft um, uh, Rabbi Berger's comment that great thinkers do not tra uh, write transparent nonsense to somehow me, may God preserve me from speaking transparent nonsense, even if that doesn't make me a great thinker or something. Um, but I would like to begin with three introductory comments. First, I am acutely aware that today's conversation is one within the Orthodox Jewish community. I am an eavesdropper overhearing a discussion that's of great personal interest to me and in some degree discusses me, but I can offer an outsider's perspective only because of the graciousness of the primary speakers. And therefore, secondly, I'm quite honored to share a panel with three such distinguished Jewish friends. I hope that my own comments as a Roman Catholic will make some contribution to this intriguing but internal Orthodox Jewish conversation. And third, I am painfully conscious, even if I do not constantly refer to it, of the sinful collective behavior of my own faith community toward the Jewish people over the past millennium. One of the Christian criteria that could be brought to bear regarding another's religious legitimacy is the Matthean statement that, quote, by their fruits you shall know them, unquote. Were Jews to apply this standard to Christian history or to perennial Christian teaching, it is hardly likely that a positive assessment would ensue, to put it mildly. All the more reason, then, for a Christian to encroach upon a, an orthodox discussion on interreligious theological dialogue without <coughs> any expectations, let alone any demands, and only in the greatest humility and deference. In this regard, I think I disagree with the Christian uh, uh, ecumenicist uh, whom Rabbi Berger quoted. Um, there's a way uh, the, to the quotation to the effect that um, there might be some uh, reason for expectation of a Jewish response to changes going on in the Catholic world. I think there's a way in which, and I want to emphasize this, that our internal Catholic reform is driven and demanded by our own religious integrity to our own understanding of our religious re uh, relationship with God, irregardless of whether Jews approve or reciprocate. In other words, we need to continue what we're doing um, because we must uh, as Christians. I also would note that I speak as a member of the majority religious community in this country, and that will uh, perhaps uh, lead me to be more self-assured uh, in uh, dispensing with some risks uh, in interreligious dialogue that members of a minority community would be more sensitive to. Now, having voiced all these caveats, I think my proper role today takes two forms. One, I can comment directly on remarks that the panel has made on Christianity, and most especially on the Roman Catholic community. And I can also raise questions of a general nature that have occurred to me, as I say, upon overhearing uh, the discussion that has occurred up to this point, in the hopes that such queries from an outsider's perspective might open up the internal conversation even further. So let me first turn to some specific remarks on the Catholic Church and the Second Vatican Council. All three speakers have commented on the post-conciliar reforms that are underway in my own community. <coughs> 
whether these reforms to date ought to affect the application of Rabbi Soloveitchik's ideas among Jews today is not for me to say. That's your discussion. What I can say is that our efforts as Catholics over the past four decades are, as Cardinal Walter Casper said last year here at Boston College, they are, quote, only the beginning of the beginning, end quote. Recent controversies in the United States over the dialogue document mentioned by Rabbi Korn, The Reflection on Covenant and Mission, and more recently over the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of Christ, indicate that enormous challenges remain for us Catholics and Christians. I would stress, though, that the aim of the post-Vatican II reform is not only to encourage dialogue between Christians and Jews, or Catholics and Jews specifically, it is also to root out utterly among Christians the supersessionist idea that the church had replaced uh, the people of Israel as God's covenanted people. This notion is so woven into the fabric of Christian history and theology that Rabbi Soloveitchik was, in my opinion, quite correct to discourage theological conversation with the community of the many, as he called us, on such terms. Now, I think it's important for Jews to understand that it is impossible for Christians to articulate our history and the religious contours of our faith without reference to Jews and Judaism. Obviously, because we originated as a distinct community in the words and deeds of late Second Temple period Jews, most especially, of course, Jesus of Nazareth. Therefore, the repudiation of supersessionism that we are engaged in in the Catholic community impacts the very heart of Christian identity and all aspects of our faith tradition. The disputes over the reflections on covenant and mission could be understood in this light as evidence of a healthy reckoning of the soul, a diagnosis of the church's central nervous system, if you will, and that this is uh, not an easily or quickly accomplished task. I do believe, however, that what has begun cannot be reversed, and our reform is indeed permanent, and we could perhaps talk more about that. So I would question, as one with some experience of the internal dynamics of the Catholic conversation, Rabbi Korn's description of three current Catholic positions about Judaism and salvation. You may recall that he had identified these three as A, the views of the authors of the Reflections on Covenant and Mission, which had concluded that for theological reasons, Christians should not be um, engaged in campaigns to target Jews for conversion. The second category was B, the views of Cardinal Walter Casper, and C, the views of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. In my opinion, the first two categories are not separate. Cardinal Casper desires a fuller treatment of the relevant soteriological issues, the questions about how we Christians understand salvation, which were not the main topic of the reflections on covenant and mission. But he agrees that Jews are in a saving covenant with God and that the Catholic Church has no offices devoted to converting Jews. But for me to explain this further, this reason why I would say there are really only two categories and not three, Trinitarian though I may be, uh, is to explain this, uh, it, I can't go any further with this because that would bring us into sort of the esoterica of Catholic theology and that's tangential to today's topic. But for similar reasons, I would also disagree with Professor Berger's, uh, Berger's interpretation of Cardinal Ratzinger's writings, which it seems to me are not so much uh, desiring a pre-eschatological conversion as they are conflicted and in process in Cardinal Ratzinger's own mind. Professor Berger's and my different readings of Cardinal Ratzinger arise, I suspect, from an insider versus an outsider's engagement with the subtleties and idiosyncrasies of Catholic, perhaps especially Vatican, theological speech. And again, these are not the focus of this panel, so I'm not going to say any more. However, I agree with uh, uh, Rabbi Berger that a linking of conversion with dialogue does exist in the hearts of some Catholics, typically ones who haven't done much dialoguing. And so the issue has not, as, as he put it, and I quote uh, uh, Rabbi Berger, has not been rendered altogether obsolete by the developments underscored by Dr. Korn, end quote. We still have a lot of work to do. So let me turn then to more general questions that occur to me having eavesdropped on this conversation. And there are sort of eight clusters of questions. Professor Berger noted that Rabbi Soloveitchik's, quote, larger argument is that the personal experience of faith cannot even be communicated. What can be communicated is intellectual, 
apprehension of faith. The problem is that this communication is pitifully inadequate, and therefore, uh, perhaps even though religious emotions could be partially expressed, and that these are what, uh, th that what grounds a person ultimately in their own faith identity is essentially private, leaving only a lonely man of faith, but also a lonely people of faith uh, in terms of faith communities. Uh, Rabbi Bergman went on to say that since Rabbi Soloveitchik believed that untrammeled interfaith dialogue presumes to enter into this very private inner realm, that interreligious dialogue about it is declared out of bounds. Now, I think this last sentence relates to Rabbi Korn's comment that Jews should, quote, exercise care and explicitly, uh, explicitly agree on the preconditions and protocols of theological dialogue before beginning the precarious journey, end quote. So these insightful comments raise these questions for me. Number one, what is untrammeled interfaith dialogue? And how would trammeled interfaith dialogue be defined? What are, to use Rabbi Korn's expression, what are the preconditions and protocols? That seems to me to be the pressing question, uh, one of the pressing questions facing us. Question two, cannot distinct religious communities discuss their ineffable, unspeakable, unpronounceable experiences of the Holy One? Now, I need to expand upon this question. While it is surely true, and I agree with everybody that has spoken to this, that one's innermost selfhood and its relationship to God cannot be communicated or sort of directly transferred from one person to another, it seems to me equally certain that the reality of another's relationship to God can be divined, if you'll pardon the expression. Perhaps this reality could be articulated, this, this transcendent reality that the other may have, could be articulated by the word holiness. Even though I would never imagine that I could enter into the personal Jewish experience of faith, I think I can identify holiness when I experience it in Jewish people or in the Jewish tradition. I may not be able to define it, but I know it when I see it, so to speak. Nor does this perception of holiness in the other automatically lead me to desire to appropriate or to absorb the holiness of the Jewish other. Christer Stendhal's evocative phrase, holy envy, comes to mind. H-O-L-Y, <laughs> uh, envy, comes to mind. I discern holiness, for example, when I glimpse the profundity of rabbinic debate on this or that issue. I realize that this presence or this manifestation of the divine presence isn't mine. It belongs to Jews. So the question is, isn't the profoundly or is not profoundly spiritual dialogue possible about one another's experiences of the Holy One within one's own tradition and even in the others? and even recognizing the fact that there is a limit to what can be conceptualized, let alone articulated, in human speech. That was the very fact that I can perceive holiness in an outside tradition to my own means that I can talk about it. Maybe. Number three, question. That wasn't enough. Is it possible for one faith tradition, having experienced holiness in another, to apprehend intellectually that the other community could be having revelatory experiences of the Holy One in which my own community doesn't share. I got to elaborate on this unsettling question from within my own Catholic context. If Christians can encounter the Holy in the rabbinic tradition, even while not entering into the worldview of that tradition, then don't we Christians have unavoidably to conclude that in Israel's perpetual covenant, God is continuously revealing God's self to the Jewish community in ways that are distinct from our own Christian experiences of God through Christ. When such revelations in relationship lead to different or even conflicting verbalizations with my own tradition's articulations or expressions of, of its understanding, do I have to automatically conclude that the rabbis got it wrong? Or would it be more true to my own tradition to hold instead, and here I'm paraphrasing something that Deborah Weissman said the other night uh, at another event that we had, um, or could I uh, hold instead that the greatness of God would be lessened if God could be apprehended in only one way? 
Can we be content? Is it possible for us together to be content to trust the Holy One? to resolve such disparities in our articulations of our experiences at the eschaton. I note in passing that this line of thinking as a Christian is especially difficult for us in regard to Islam, more so than Judaism, because it involves us thinking about post-Christic revelations of the divine in a way that's different uh, in terms of our orientation toward Judaism. Question number four. Doesn't the very existence of communities of faith imply that inter-community conversation is possible? Professor Berger suggested that the essentially private personal commitment to God of the lonely man of faith is analogous to a lonely people of faith, whose communal commitment to God is also ultimately private and therefore ineffable. However, if individual incommunicability a great Scrabble word, can be sufficiently overcome so as to permit communities of shared faith discourse, then analogously, why wouldn't it be possible, even if more difficult, for two distinct faith communities, especially if they are historically and or theologically related, to sufficiently overcome their particular communal experiences and permit some sort of intelligible discourse between them? Now, Indeed, if my last sentence was in any way comprehensible to anyone else in this room, I think I've proved my point. To move to another subject, all three of my colleagues seem to agree that Rabbi Soloveitchik's greatest concern was the pressure that dialogue inevitably asserts to, quote, trade theological favors, end quote, with a resulting loss of identity and spiritual distinctiveness. In an email to me a few days ago, Rabbi Clapper expressed this informally, but I thought rather eloquently. Quote, the absence of halakhic rhetoric in confrontation does, is a deliberate effort on Rabbi Soloveitchik's part to avoid introducing the question of the theological status of Christianity, which from existing halakhic perspective is certainly not one of absolute equality with Judaism. The Rav, I'm continuing the quote, actually opposed precisely the dialogue Dr. Korn advocates on the grounds that si such dialogue exists only when one forms community and a collective identity. And community, as Dr. Korn correctly notes, presumes absolute equality. And requiring all parties to make that presupposition amounts to trading theological favors. Now, when I read these words, I was reminded of the words of the Vatican document that Professor Berger mentioned, Dominus Jesus, from the year 2000, which said as follows, quote, equality, which is a presupposition of interreligious dialogue, refers to the equal personal dignity of the parties in dialogue, not to doctrinal content, nor even less to the position of Jesus Christ in relation to the founders of other religions, end quote. So I guess whatever else we could say, it would seem that our two traditions are at least equal in claiming the superiority of our respective foundational truth claims. Mm -hmm. But to return to my role of raising questions, number five, how are we to understand absolute <laughs> equality? Obviously, absolute equality cannot mean abandoning defining truth claims for the sake of interreligious conversation. But is that the only way to define equality in this context? Could not the equality required for interreligious dialogue include the equality of all human beings as made in God's image, as has been mentioned? The equality that stems from freedom of religion or freedom of conscience? The equality that springs from the realization that the Holy One cannot be fully compassed by human beings? The equality that prevails when all parties have set aside the objective of trying to convert the other? Question six. What kind of preparation for theological dialogue is needed in either community? Rabbi Soloveitchik was concerned about the preparation of those Orthodox Jews who might speak officially to Christians. Well, if so, this is a concern for Christians too. Neither community has much prior experience or precedent of mutually enriching interreligious dialogue to draw upon. We're feeling our way along in an unprecedented historical moment. I also think that something has to be said about how we conceive of our respective religious traditions. On a historical level, 
it seems hard to deny that our two communities have been influencing one another for ill, as well as for good, for many, many centuries. Is it possible then to speak of Judaism and Christianity as if they were two isolated, disconnected realities? I am not arguing that there are not profound differences between <coughs> us, nor do I feel that there shouldn't be legitimate boundaries between us. Perhaps echoing here Professor's Berger, uh, Professor Berger's phrase about theological discussion that knows its place. Of course, what's that? I am wondering if a fear of a loss of identity, a fear that Christians and Jews both experience when they engage each other substantively, functions uniquely for Jews and Christians, as opposed to, say, when Christians encounter Hindus or when Jews encounter Muslims. It's different for us. Our fear of loss of identity is stronger because we have been interacting for so long and have at least partially defined ourselves with one eye on each other. So the question, finally, number seven. By the way, I might note in passing that we also have multiple identities. We are residents of a certain country. We are uh, engaged in certain occupations. And so identity is a complex, multi-dimensional reality. Number seven, if it is true to any degree that Christian and Jewish identities have been shaped by the encounter with each other, then isn't it logical to expect that by engaging in interreligious dialogue, Jews and Christians will actually intensify their respective identities because their similarities and differences will be personally experienced. I think the virtually unanimous experience of people involved in the dialogue, that their understanding and appreciation of their own tradition has deepened because of the dialogue, demonstrates this point. However, such Jews and Christians will also be changed by that encounter to the extent that any distortions or stereotypes of the other were at work in their own self-understanding. The boundaries will have shifted, and this shift will be upsetting to co-religionists on either side, again to the degree that those co-religionists' understanding of themselves was shaped by caricatures of the other tradition. Finally, I have to wonder if in the 21st century we really don't have any choice, despite our appropriate hesitations and concerns. <coughs> we are horribly aware that our world is afflicted by conflicts in which religious traditions are employed to foster hatred and violence. Stereotyping and caricature prevail among too many religious people, including here in the United States. Religious communities, I think we would agree, ought to be agents of social reconciliation and of shalom. However, I believe, given the various complex histories at work, that only intense interreligious dialogue can enable people of faith to play their proper role in the wider society. Which leads to my last question. Might not Christians and Jews have a special responsibility and a special opportunity in this regard? If we are able to assist each other in turning around our troubled relationship, troubled <laughs> relationship, not into some sort of syncretistic spirituality, but into one in which Jews and Christians can respect and even value and learn from our differences, then what more powerful example could there be for a world so desperately in need of hope? Thank you. I want to thank all of the respondents and everyone who's participated. I think given the hour that we should just open the floor to uh, questions from the people who are gathered here. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I find that one of the issues that uh, was raised was the difference between how Jews might have the interfaith dialogue and the Catholics might have it has to do with the majority community and the minority community. I'm wondering if there's also a difference between a history of um, evolution in theological thinking uh, between the two different faiths. Uh, I noticed that nobody brought up the issue that I have a concern maybe interfaith dialogue would lead to an 
reassessment of certain halachic positions that Judaism has for Christianity. And presumably that's something that is not to be feared because we are familiar with the fact that halacha does go through a process of change and reassessment, and um, maybe that would be welcome, or at least not, or at least something that would not be objectionable. Um, and the concern seems much more that our faith, our theological positions, might evolve, might change. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if this has a lot to do with the fact that Judaism, uh, Orthodox Judaism, um, does not have the same tradition of an evolving theology as Catholicism does, and if that could have a lot to do with also the different perspectives. Thank you. I was asked to try to repeat and encapsul encapsulate the question because it, they couldn't hear in the back. So that was what the gesture was, yes. Um, what uh, Rabbi Linzer asked was that, that there's some differences between the majority and minority community in this case in terms of the development of uh, particularly attitude towards theological change and that there are, our evolution within dialogue is taking different routes, and whether there's a, an openness to halachic change in Judaism, and particularly in Orthodox Judaism, that doesn't exist in the realm of theological change, because in the Jewish world there's not an experience and a history of thinking about evolving theology. I think you have a microphone right there. So just a, a few thoughts about that, but before I begin, I would like to uh, acknowledge the presence of Dr. Tara Torsky, the daughter of Rav Soloveitchik, and we're honored by your presence, Dr. Torsky. Um, I think uh, the question, the issue of, of whether, in fact, uh, theological dialogue, or for that matter, dialogue on social, political, or ethical issues that, that Rav Soloveitchik said was highly desirable, um, that kind of relationship and dialogue leading to change, both on a theological and a halakhic level, is, I think, one of the great fears of the Orthodox community. You know, depending upon what side of the mechitza you sit or, or what Orthodox community you're in, evolution is a bracha or a klala. It's a blessing or a curse. Um, and I think uh, people are, gen are generally fearful, not, not necessarily uh, in an unjustified sense of, of that kind of a change, that kind of a change. But, but one thing, you know, there's an old saying that you really can't determine whether a chicken is kosher or treif unless you see the chicken. You know, you can't do it without the empirical data in front of you. And I think, you know, that's very true even in terms of how we understand, how, how Jews, Orthodox Jews, Halachic Jews, understand Christianity and Christians. We can't only think about what happened in the Middle Ages. We have to understand w what contemporary doctrines are, who these people are, and have a responsible uh, uh, understanding and halachic response to that. Now, to some people, that's quite frightening. Quite frightening. To other people, it's the hallmark of spiritual and intellectual integrity. So it's a double edged sword. David. Yeah, just uh, you know, a brief comment. Uh, first, um, I think sociologically, the observation that the absence of interest in theology by Orthodox Jews is an impediment to uh, interest in this enterprise is absolutely correct. Um, whether this is good or bad is another question, but as a, as a sociological observation, I think it's absolutely correct. Uh, the, the interest in theology, as that term is usually understood, is exceedingly, uh, uh, let's say, tenuous or uh, I can't say exceedingly infinitesimal because those don't go together, so I'll just say infinitesimal. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I think that's, that's true. Uh, now, the, the question, uh, however, about uh, halacha versus theology in the context of change uh, is, in this case, uh, I think a very serious uh, uh, issue. And I, uh, here I come down uh, on, the, uh, on a conservative small c side uh, because there is, uh, of course, a, uh, an intimate relationship between halacha and theology on the issue of, 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 of Avodah Zarah. Uh, and 
since the theological issue is at the core of, of Judaism in a very important sense, the halacha consequences that follow from it are also at the core of Judaism. Uh, and here, uh, the historical experience, uh, which is fraught with, uh, with uh, nothing less than martyrdom, uh, makes the prospect of, of change um, daunting uh, and um, certainly not something that should be uh, entertained because of uh, a sociological transformation in Jewish-Christian relations. Just to reiterate that to the, into the microphone, what's the, what? Do you want to clarify a little bit more? Yeah, the, what, what do you see as <laughs> obviously it, it's quite tragic when someone like that dies? Uh, Most of our panel is not from Boston, so if okay. you want to explain. Uh, when, when, what do you see as the role of when uh, somebody very prominent uh, passed away? Now, uh, obviously, uh, Brian Honan died at the age of 39 of complications of bile duct. A lot of Jews and Catholics who were friends or worked with him and so forth. Um, uh, what is the role of what can be the role of the funeral wake, the funeral, the one-year memorial anniversary service in bringing Jews and Catholics together? Okay, so the question is, what when there's a public event that is specific, specific within one community, like right, the death yeah. of a prominent Catholic, or I might add, well, the well, death of a prominent Jew? Jew what is, how does that operate in terms of bringing Jews and Catholics together? Right. Um, well, I would say there's two answers. It, you talked about wakes, and I am unalterably opposed to Jews and Catholics or Christians you know, participating in joint religious uh, events, be they services, wakes, masses. I think it's a, that's a very, very dangerous line that cannot be crossed. Um, so I would say excluding those kinds of memorials where there's a religious ritual and religious prayer going on, um, then I think it's not a theological issue at all. It's, a, it's an issue of basic civility, of moral responsibility. When, when someone in the community passes away, uh, someone who's done enormous good in civil society uh, for one part of the community, for the entire community, it's, it's basic. I, I, it's basic ethical integrity, it's basic social responsibility for appropriate responses. I believe that this is one of the things that, that Rav Soloveitchik was alluding to when he talked about cooperation on quote unquote secular issues or moral political matters. I think it's a betrayal of, of from the Jewish point of view, a betrayal of our fundamental belief that human beings uh, command intrinsic respect because of being created in the image of God when, when a faithful servant of, of the society passes away or when there's a tragedy and we, we fail to acknowledge it, I think that that's an enormous religious as well as social mistake. Professor Schreier.
goes against the grain of the romantic notion that at the heart of language lies the idea that it's incommensurate with certain profound experiences, particularly religious experiences. In other words, the tension in confrontation between it being a word of rhetoric that tries to persuade and it being ironically, because doubly ironically, an acknowledgement that it is at the heart of language that uh, we can see the, uh, its incommensurability with the experience that it tries to communicate. For that, I find the sort of reassessment of the dialogue uh, of great interest, but also I feel that not to acknowledge the, uh, this dimension is perhaps not to see that uh, in its most brilliant, the essay goes to the heart of why the dialogue is uh, practically unthinkable, uh, impossible, uh, not, as a theologi uh, not as a theological issue, but one of uh, language, of semiotics perhaps even. And I could go further about this. I mean, clearly, for communication to occur, you need five, it's, 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 it's plain obvious, five conditions. A speaker, the addressee, the message, the code, and the sharing of the code by the speaker and the addressee. The question that uh, seems important is uh, whether the sharing of the code is something that, uh, you know, is uh, of interest uh, theologically, or is it uh, an issue that is strictly restricted to uh, the philosophy of language, shall we say. Well, let me stop. But I just want to tell you that this is something that uh, fascinates me about this essay uh, for its implications, not just for this particular issue, but for uh, broader cultural uh, perspectives as well. Okay, and I have to summarize that in one sentence. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's incommunicable. <laughs> Uh, the, the question is really to asking the panel to address the tension within the essay between its rhetorical use of the ab attempt to persuade versus its philosophical claim that that persuasion is ultimately impossible because the communication, uh, the, the, the code of communication and the content of communication may not be communicated. That's inadequate, but I think we'll help. I don't really feel competent to respond to this. I don't have any expertise in philosophy of language. Uh, what I would, uh, my, my uh, instinctive reaction is, is roughly as follows. Uh, I use the term rhetorical hyperbole about this argument. Uh, and uh, in effect, uh, I think that the Rav was uh, using a, an extremely powerful rhetorical tool uh, to uh, make an argument that was stronger than the practical consequences that he actually wanted to be uh, 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 gleaned from it uh, in order to um, prevent people from doing something he didn't want them to do. Uh, and um, the rhetoric does have this deep irony in that it argues for, it argues rhetorically for incommunicability, but it doesn't argue that everything is incommunicable. It argues that particular kinds of religious experience uh, are incommunicable. I don't think that the argument goes uh, so far as to say that communication is, is impossible with anyone with any kind of a different code. It depends, you know, how different the codes are. One of the scholars, an Orthodox scholar, said that unless uh, this is an interreligious dialogue, not an interreligious dialogue, and he said that unless you believe in the Orthodox view, then the, we can't discuss you know, even the Torah study with anybody else. And the other scholar said that that's, uh, they don't believe in that, that you don't have to believe in Greek mythology to, uh, to teach Greek mythology. And I was wondering, again, uh, uh, in an in, in interreligious dialogue, that, uh, that if, if, if if, let's say uh, at JTS, the Jewish Theological Seminary, they teach that the Bible was written by human authors and was written at uh, much later times than in the Exodus. Do, 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 uh, do still major, does, does major uh, Orthodox scholars believe that they, we, can't, uh, we can't communicate with that view? Because I know I've been in some uh, universities now, I, I got an article off the internet last week, and it said that uh, a couple of Orthodox uh, uh, scholars are warning uh, parents about some of the students who grew up Orthodox when they go to universities when they're learning 
be secular ideas, but they might, uh, have, they, might they might be changing their, their, their orthodox viewpoints. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is whether there is communication around uh, or dialogue when people are coming from sort of incommensurate p points of view, and the specific question was, I think, almost an inner Jewish question right. uh, in terms of uh, understandings of whether we're talking about Torah min Shemayim, whether we're talking about Torah as revealed from heaven, or taking a biblical critical view of its being uh, derived. And you make reference to some uh, some uh, comments or that have been passed around uh, by students at Harvard, so maybe Very Rabbi Clapper, you should take this one, um, <laughs> who are criticizing the, uni the, the university as being a place that's inappropriate for Orthodox students. Um, all places <laughs> to have the pamphlet come up. <laughs> I, thought this, um, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's a, um, a unique case, and the issue is, in general, um, whether there is a purpose and value to religious dialogue with people who take positions that, right, to take positions intellectual or theological, which one a priori believes are incorrect, right? Which one has a faith commitment to believing are incorrect, right? And we're leaving out, I'm not evaluating that particular position, but let's take, right, certainly, right, it's a reasonable position to say that Orthodox Judaism takes a faith, right, takes, right, as a faith claim that the documentary hypothesis is incorrect. So is there a value in such discussion? It depends, I think, along the lines of um, both Professor, uh, Professor Berger and Dr. Korn's analyses as to what, right, what, what, what is the imperative to engage in dialogue with such a person, what, right, and what are the costs, um, both to oneself and to one's community, of engaging in such dialogue? Um, and I think that very much depends on context. Um, there are contexts in which you end up, you know, if you believe that your Torah should influence a broader <laughs> community, so then if you say, I'm not going to talk with anybody who doesn't share my presuppositions, you're never going to influence anyone who doesn't share your presuppositions. Um, but there are costs always in exposing yourself as well. I, don't, I wouldn't make, give a generic answer. Okay. Dr. Weissman. Uh, I want to thank you all for a very uh, stimulating afternoon. I live in Jerusalem, and I engage in uh, interreligious dialogue in Israel. And that, of course, is a different context where the majority culture is Jewish. And I have to say that for many of us in Israel, including a lot of religiously observant Jews who engage in dialogue, the dangers of not engaging in dialogue are far greater than the dangers of engaging in dialogue. And I, I sense a kind of hesitation and fear about dialogue that I don't think we feel, perhaps because of our unique context. Um, my question is to the, to, to the Jewish panel, about this issue of trading favors and not making demands on the Catholic community so that they won't make <coughs> demands on us, you know. And if the Catholic community is engaged in their own kind of cheshbon nefesh, of, of uh, soul searching, <coughs> about, uh, things that the uh, church has done in the past, might we not do our own soul, soul searching? Not, it's not symmetrical. It's not symmetrical partly because we didn't have power but Yehuda Levi and the Kuzari suggest that maybe had we had power, we might not have been quite as uh, moral and ethical as we like to portray ourselves. Should we not do our own soul searching about certain elements of our tradition that are derogatory towards non-Jews in general, towards Christians in particular? Um, and I, I have to say that frankly, I don't see that parallel parallel or non-parallel process taking place? So the question here was, uh, first of all, from a perspective of life in Israel, what the, about the dangers of non-engagement, whether that becomes a, a factor in this dialogue. Uh, and also the question of whether uh, trade, whether a process of soul searching on the Jewish side is in and of itself necessary, generated by internal Jewish needs, and can be seen as something other than trading favors. Eugene. Uh, thank you for the question, Professor Weissman. I also experienced what you experienced in Yerushalayim many years ago. That's how I eventually, that's how I really began um, talking seriously on a, on a religious level with, uh, with Christians in Yerushalayim. 
And, um, you know, one can analyze the cognitive content of the positions and, and the theologies, but the fact of the matter is that there's an enormous, enormous difference between the kind of discussion that takes place in Yerushalayim and the kind of discussion that takes place here, precisely because of the reversal of the majority-minority issue that Professor Cunningham uh, alluded to. It's a reverse dynamic. In other words, Jews here, I think, uh, justifiably so, feel very, very vulnerable to the much larger Christian culture as they see it. It may not be a Christian culture anymore, but Jews see it as such. Um, and in Yerushalayim, Jews are in the majority and have much less to fear from a sociological level. Um, uh, so that's an un unmistakable uh, uh, dimension of the dialogical relationship. And then on the issue of Cheshbon HaNefesh, I think you're absolutely right. Now this frightens many, many Jews. It's frightening because it's difficult. And, and for this, I would refer the audience to the famous, I think, I think it's footnote number four in Ish Halacha, where Rav Soloveitchik describes the nature of the spiritual life as being torturous and enormously complex and uh, not easy. If you want to have spiritual integrity, you must engage in cheshbon hanefesh. You must, and when you, when you dispense with that, then I think you become spiritually very shallow. Um, and therefore, I think it, it, it would have enormous benefit for all faith traditions, uh, including Judaism, to engage in this kind of introspection uh, uh, seriously and um, seriously look at, at how uh, we look at others and um, whether, in fact, uh, our stereotypes are warranted, whether our judgments accord with the facts, and what will make us greater spiritual human beings. Now, this is very difficult to do in the context of a historical relationship where we have been persecuted. Um, uh, in a variety of ways. But I think spiritual integrity demands that take place. Uh, let, me, let me say something briefly. This is a very difficult uh, question. The second half of that question is a very difficult question for me. Uh, one of the most difficult things I've, I've written, which is, has not yet appeared in print, uh, was uh, presented at the uh, Orthodox uh, Forum in the year 2000, and uh, it's called... Uh, Jews, uh, Gentiles, and the contemporary egalitarian ethos, some tentative thoughts. And what it amounts to is, you know, a struggle with your question. Um, now, for, for me, uh, uh, and this is just a personal uh, sense, uh, I would like, and I do, divide this question into a purely theological part and a part that has to do with how one deals with other human beings who are decent people. Uh, and uh, I think that Jews ought to uh, reevaluate certain positions in the dominant uh, strain of the tradition in favor of the uh, position that uh, is usually just in terms of a code word described as that of the Me'iri. Uh, but I am not willing to do this through the means of um, transforming basic, what I see as basic Jewish beliefs regarding uh, the uh, proper parameters of the understanding of God and the understanding of Avodah Zarah. So, uh, you know, that's, that's my personal sense here. It's very difficult to do that, uh, as Dr. Cohen just said, in the United States. Uh, it, the kinds of passage you, passages you are describing uh, are available on a, a whole set of anti-Semitic websites. Uh, I have a former student who uh, who uh, was working at the ADL, uh, in uh, and his job is to monitor and respond to uh, anti-Talmud websites. One of which he said is actually named after Nicholas Donin, uh, in honor of Nicholas Donin, the Jewish convert to Christianity who attacked the Talmud in 1240. Uh, so, you know, I I think it's morally necessary to do this. 
Uh, but I think that the context in which to do it is probably not formal dialogue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, just to, um, to add to that, I think that there's, um, yeah, there's a simple level which Dr. Korn alluded to earlier, which is that, sorry, which is that granted the um, contemporary changes in Catholic theology um, and that those of us who deal with deciding Jewish law for Orthodox Jews who live in a non right, a non sealed world continually have to address you know just for the integrity of our internal lives as halachic Jews right what that means um, so I think I think it's you know, it's clearly imperative on anyone who lives in that world who has to address the que you know has to address questions of people who ask you you know can I go to this wedding in this place right um, right things like that there's no um, there's no there's no choice, but to there's no choice but to know much more, right um, about right about one's about the religions of the people around one, uh, you know it, as a uh, you know, as, as a as a Harvard chaplain right so I continually have to address the question of my roommate ha right, my roommate has an idol, <laughs> um, am I allowed to tie my shoelaces, in the room, um, because I'm going to be bow right bowing down before the idol. Um, right, so, right, so, right, so one has to right, one has to understand what the right, what the spiritual content content uh, you know content of a statue, right, uh, of a statue is. I think that's um, I think that's um, clear, and that obviously that should be done with integrity. There are deeper questions that come up, and I'll tell a similar story. Um, in my I believe my first year um, at Harvard. A student who was returning to Jewish observance came to me and wanted to know he had a choice. When he went home, his parents were not at all sympathetic to his observance of, of, of Sabbath. But his, um, but his roommate, um, who, lived, who lived on the same block, was extremely sympathetic. The only difference is that his roommate was filled, literally lived in a house which was filled with Hindu statuettes. <laughs> and the issue was, was it better to spend Shabbat at home or is it better to, is it better to spend Shabbat right, in a house which was deeply sympathetic to his spirituality in which he could, so to speak, experience holiness, um, right? And it, right, but at the same token would be in constant tension with, um, in constant tension with halacha. Um, and I think that's, um, that's something which requires um, real, um, real, cheshbon, uh, real cheshbon and nefesh, unquestionably. But I, I, I agree with Professor Berger that my own experience but an intra-Jewish dialogue is an intra-Jewish experience as well, as that doing that in a context of mutual exploration or dialogue almost always leads to shallowness. Shallowness. Yeah, I'd like to throw in uh, from the outside uh, just a, a comment, particularly on something that Professor Berger said about um, the conversation, um, this internal reckoning is indeed an internal one. But particularly on the question of Avodah Zarah, um, it seems to me that that dynamic I mentioned earlier about the way our two traditions have been bouncing off one another for centuries makes it impossible to be a purely, even if it's a principally, internal conversation. Because um, it requires uh, an understanding of the other faith tradition as it understands itself in its own frames of reference which is not done, it's not possible to do purely from the outside. Now how one negotiates that inner and outer dimension beats me, but, but I, I don't think it can be done with integrity without that. In addition, just to make life more complicated, as we all know, the, the, um, we're dealing with moving targets here in a sense, that there isn't a univocal Christianity any more than there's a univocal <laughs> Judaism. Um, and so uh, if the question were specifically in an Avodah Zarah context of what do Christians or who, to whom do Christians understand that they pray, there's going to be a multiplicity of answers to that question and a multiplicity of answers over time as well as space. And so how does that get factored into a question of a halakhic sort of engagement with Christian self-identity when that identity itself is pluriform? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. One last question, Rabbi Samuels. 
maybe Rabbi Salavich didn't believe should be dialoguing and, and communicating in that way. Is this rhetoric? Is this etiquette? Or is this really a deep-seated respect and appreciation for intrinsic work that different faith communities have? Right. Briefly, uh, that the question is whether the com whether the panel would comment on the valuing of other faith communities that's embedded in the in the language and the rhetoric of confrontation. I, I, in, this is speculation. You know, I, I really don't know what was in the Rub's mind when when he wrote this. But I personally don't believe it's rhetoric. I, I believe that he felt this was a serious religious value. Um, if you look at what he writes about the notion of image of God, uh, conferring dignity upon every human being, I think this is very consistent with that. And by the way, I, I said I had in a footnote, kind of half seriously, half not seriously, that it's very interesting that the confrontation was taken as the de facto policy of the Orthodox community. Not quite, because in confrontation you have a positive commandment to do something and a prohibition, one could say, if you want to put it in halachic terms. And the community listened very carefully to the law, to the prohibition against theological interfaith discussion. But to my knowledge, really never took up Rav Soloveitchik's challenge of engaging in serious cooperation with the Christian community on issues of, of ethics and politics and social concern. So um, it became, half of it was, was listened to very carefully. The other half, I think, um, there's a lot more work to be done. It is 5 o'clock, but Dr. Tversky has a question. Do you want to come speak in the microphone so people can hear you? Thank you. Uh, I think because we have two speakers who do need to get to the airport, we're going to have to conclude the formal part of this discussion. I see several more people itching to discuss and to raise questions, and I apologize <coughs> for that. But this has been a mind-opening afternoon, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Korn and the respondents, Dr. Berger, Rabbi, Rabbi Clapper, and Professor uh, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you.